it's just not possible to gain that much in value that quickly with declining revenue. And that's when I really had the epiphany that investing was not about stocks and bonds. Investing is about innovation. The belief is if there's a new piece of information, that it will be instantly incorporated into the price of the stock or the bond or whatever. But that's not how people change their minds. Welcome back. I'm Hayden Brain, and you're listening to Opto Sessions, where we interview the top traders and investors from around the world, uncovering their secrets to success. Dan Kemp is Morningstar's Global Chief Investment Officer. Having joined the firm back in 2014 as co-head of investment consulting and portfolio management for EMEA, Dan was promoted to the region's CIO the following year. Prior to Morningstar, Dan was a founding partner at Albemarle Street Partners, responsible for client risk profiling, fund research, portfolio construction, and asset allocation, with a wealth of experience in devising investment strategies that seek long-term outperformance. Dan was the perfect guest to discuss how best to manage investment exposure amid the tragic invasion of Ukraine and the resulting geopolitical crisis. We discussed the effect of the crisis so far on major global indices, including the FTSE 100, the Hang Seng and the S&P 500, before digging into Morningstar's outlook for each region. I finished by asking Dan where Morningstar believe value is right now and how best to identify the intrinsic value of a company amid so much market noise. Enjoy. Welcome, Dan. It's great to have you on the show. How's your week been so far? Uh, Hayden, it is great to be with you. Thank you for having me on. So actually, this week's been quite unusual for me because I've been based in our Chicago office rather than London, where Mm. where I'm normally based. So I've been fighting off a bit of jet lag, but it's been great to catch up with the team here because I've had so little opportunity to see them over the last two years. Yeah, I can imagine say that must have been the first time you've been out there for a little while. Uh, how are things in Chicago? What's the COVID situation like over there? Well, they, they've just got rid of their mask mandate. So it's quite similar to how it is in the, in the UK. And again, that mix of people being, being cautious, uh, that background of, uh, of, of COVID still being, being around, but that sense of uh, emerging from that last Omicron wave. So a sense of optimism, uh, but also a sense of, of recovery from where uh, the, the whole world has been for the last two years. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, let's kick off with a question that won't necessarily flow chronologically, but it will offer an early indication, I think, of where we're headed through the rest of the interview. And that is in a market such as this, with obviously the geopolitical situation we've got going on, the macro environment that that is unfolding before us, should investors stay invested and think long term, or is actually cash the right place to be now? Yeah, so Hayden, I think that's the most important question, whether we're in a situation as we are at the moment where these terrible uh, invasions going on in Ukraine and, and all the other things that are going on around the world, or even just any other point in the investment cycle is always uh, news around, there's always things to distract investors. And we just have to keep reminding ourselves that investment is always a long-term pursuit. Uh, very few people are really investing for the next few hours, uh, days, or, or weeks, or even, even months. Most people are investing because they need to do, deliver a return on their capital in order to reach their long-term financial goals, whether that's retirement or, or anything else. And so in, in that context, uh, actually staying invested is one of the most important things that you can do as an investor. It's very tempting when markets are volatile to, to take all your money out and, uh, and, and go to cash or, or do something completely different with it. Uh, but in reality, people that do that struggle to find the right time to get back into the market. Mm. And that lost time uh, can really have an impact longer term. And so people should certainly be thinking about the risks in their portfolio and, and thinking about where returns may come from over the, the next few years. But, uh, but don't be tempted to sell out of everything. Uh, it might save you some money in the very short term, but it's likely to cause you problems in the long term as you ponder when to reinvest. Yeah, absolutely. Completely agree. And we'll return to that theme later on in the interview. But let's start by taking a look at major equity indices from around the globe, just to set the context for the rest of the interview. So firstly, the US, the S&P 500 is is down around 9% for the year, having checked just before the call. So it's actually relatively flat since the uh, invasion of Ukraine began, uh, up a couple of percent, I believe. So 
Have we hit the low, in your opinion, or do you think there's further to go for US stocks? So the the danger about trying to find a, a low in the market is that it gets us into this mindset of uh, thinking the future is deterministic. And the future isn't deterministic, it's probabilistic. There's a very wide range of potential outcomes. And as humans, we struggle to cope with that. And so as soon as we start thinking about, well, have we reached a, a, a bottom, uh, then that colors the way that we think about investment and we become overconfident. And that's a, that's a real problem. So I, instead of saying, is this the low, what I would say is, what is reflected in current valuations? Uh, and does, does the, the current price make for an attractive valuation looking out over the long term? And when we think about US equities, uh, then they still look expensive to us. They're not, not as expensive as they, as they were, and, and particularly some of the most expensive parts of the market, the, the, the sort of technology stocks that we've all been uh, uh, thinking about the last few years, uh, they're much cheaper than they were. But there was a difference between something being cheaper than it was, uh, so a discount, and a genuine bargain. Uh, and we wouldn't see that in the US at the moment. We still think expected returns are quite low in US equity markets. And so while this is not necessarily a, a, a low, uh, we certainly wouldn't see it as a great buying opportunity because stocks are below their fair, their fair value. And so w- there's, there's uh, other markets that are trading more cheaply around the world. Uh, the, the, the US doesn't look that attractive. Yeah, okay. Well, um, I think that answers a couple of questions around sort of valuations that I have for US equities and particularly tech. So let's move on to those other areas of the world then, starting with China and just Asia markets. Uh, they present an even more volatile picture right now, I think it would be fair to say. Uh, you've got Chinese stocks listed in Hong Kong. They had their worst day since the uh, global financial crisis on Monday, I believe. Um, you had the wider Hang Seng Index hitting a six-year low on Tuesday. Um, Since that low, however, the index has rocketed over 16% on the promises of the uh, governmental support that we saw yesterday. So just generally speaking, to kick off, should investors exposed to China equities be be looking up? Should they be bullish on the medium term outlook? Or actually, is, is there further to go and actually bearish sentiment should prevail here? When we think about about China, then we've seen those declines in, in prices, and that's fundamentally changed the, the narrative that you hear around the market. And I always find this absolutely fascinating, how people move from thinking about the, the long-term returns uh, available in the Chinese market, the quality of some of those large technology stocks uh, a, a year ago, or 18 months ago, and then following uh, the, um, the actions of the, of the Chinese government, which changed the landscape or appeared to change the landscape of Chinese technology companies, uh, then people seem to be trying to find reasons uh, to mark down uh, the value of Chinese stocks and forgetting about the argument that was in place beforehand. Now, you, there's certainly a discussion to be had about whether the fundamentals of these technology stocks has has changed when the fundamental value has, has changed, and that's a that's a good debate. But it seems to us uh, that when prices were were getting uh, much lower, even at the beginning of, of this week, uh, that actually people were getting too pessimistic about the outlook for these uh, these, these very high quality businesses. And so, if you take a if you take a long term view, uh, then we do see. Uh, Chinese equities, particularly large cap Chinese technology companies, uh, as attractively priced. There is a risk there, of course, of uh, geopolitical uncertainty. And people are much more aware of that today than they were uh, six months ago and certainly 18 18 months ago. It's a question of how you you weight that into the the future. And it's it's a very difficult thing to incorporate because it is a um, a low probability, high impact event. They're always the the most difficult ones for us as as humans to get our heads around. But even when you take that into account, it it seemed to us that Chinese technology companies earlier in the week uh, got to very uh, attractive prices, are still attractively priced, but as you say, are a very volatile part of the, the world at the moment. And so the danger is that if you're, if you're too aggressive in your positioning in that, in that, uh, that market, you're, you're too quick to buy, you're too quick to sell, then there's a real danger of being whipsawed. And so, uh, again, I think about uh, if you're going to invest in that market, building up positions over time uh, because it is such a volatile market. Yeah, absolutely. Completely take your point. And then if you were to look at a portfolio holistically and think about regional exposure, you know, there are some interesting opportunities there, particularly those tech stocks that were 
potentially sort of over beaten down by the, the regulatory crackdowns that we saw last year and all of the kind of headwinds that came off the back of that. There is opportunity as a result, but don't necessarily make it central to a portfolio. Would that be a fair assessment? Absolutely. Uh, you know, it's, it's a relatively small part of the, the market in a, an uncertain uh, political environment. And so you, you have to take that risk into, into account. And of course, for any investor, then your, the first decision is going to be the uh, proportion of your portfolio that you have in, in equities. Mm-hmm. And the bulk of that would probably be in developed market equities. It may even be in your home uh, equity market, if, mm-hmm. it's a, if that's a large equity market, you expect the liabilities to be there. And so in that scenario, Chinese technology will probably only be a very small part of your, your portfolio as part of a, a, a broader diversification of your assets. So, so yes, it's, it's not a question of uh, putting a large portion of your capital into into Chinese technology that that adds a, a massive amount of specific risk into your into your portfolio. Uh, but at the edges, as you're looking for, um, for for different drivers of returns, then we see that as potentially attractive. Yeah. Okay. Completely take your point. So let's continue that sort of whistle stop tour around the globe then uh, and land back in the UK. Uh, tailwinds like a falling unemployment rate uh, being offset potentially by a decrease in average pay uh, that fell by 1% between November and January, which is likely to be exacerbated by growing inflationary pressures as well, of course. So firstly, I guess that's an assessment and there's some subjective points in there. Do you agree with that assessment and what would you add to that? I think there's a, there's a few points you need to bear in mind when thinking about UK investment. The first is that the UK stock market is very different from the UK economy. So if you look at the, the large companies in the UK, the typical global companies, uh, they derive the, the majority of their revenue outside the UK. They're much more geared into the, into the global economy. The second is that, again, if you, if you look at the UK stock market, then there's an overemphasis in certain parts of the market and an underemphasis in not. So we, we don't have large technology companies as the US has, uh, but we do have uh, large energy exposure, large uh, financial exposure. It's a, it's a different market characteristic. And then the, the third thing I'd say is even if uh, we're thinking about the broader UK stock markets, so when you get down into the, uh, the mid-sized companies and the smaller companies, there, there probably is more of a link to the UK economy but it's very dangerous to draw a straight line from what's happening in the economy to what's going to happen to asset prices, partly because you can assume that economic changes are well known and so are incorporated into asset prices very quickly. And so typically investors don't have an advantage there. We don't have an advantage in saying, well, this is what I personally think is going to happen at an economic level and therefore I have an edge in terms of picking a UK uh, domestically orientated mid-cap stocks. It, it, it's unfortunately not that not that simple. So with most people, if you're investing in the UK, you're going to be in large cap stocks. It's going to be global uh, and even then disconnected to, to what's happening at a purely economic level. So much is already priced in to these companies. You need to be, be wary about your confidence there. Yeah, okay. Completely take your point. Um, I guess what I was driving at with the reference to inflation was that with the geopolitical tensions that we have at the moment, and obviously the tragic invasion of Ukraine, that is taking the headlines, and rightly so. But should investors see the predominant challenge, I suppose, as inflation and as the rate hikes that will take place throughout the year, as opposed to the geopolitical noise that we have going on at this moment in time, no matter how obviously tragic? Hayden, that's a really important point that... uh, for investors, inflation is always the enemy. Uh, that's what's always lurking at your door, trying to reduce the value of your capital. And uh, sometimes it's more obvious as it is right now, and, and sometimes it's, it's less obvious and, uh, and people don't have to take into account. But the reality is the challenge with dealing with inflation is that inflation is a measure of change, not of level. And it's easy for us to forget that. But once we've had an enormous hike in prices, which we've had in, in energy and other to use car prices, that sort of thing, once we've had this big price rise, unless we have another uh, price rise again next year, uh, then inflation will drop back down. Uh, so actually, it's, it's the rate of change we're measuring with inflation. So it needs to be perpetuated by continual price rises. And that tends not to happen in, in goods uh, because the supply uh, squeezes that we've seen this year, which are partly a result of the 
the pandemic and the supply squeeze that we see ahead as a result of the war and, and other issues, uh, then they are likely to be in some way uh, transient, that they will uh, probably pass. The real question for central banks is, does that feed into uh, wage hikes? And if it does, then the, the wage hikes then feed back into prices and create that uh, sort of self-sustaining loop that we're, we were so familiar with in the, in the sort of 60s and, and 70s. And, and that's what, what central banks would be concerned about. That's what investors need to be concerned about. Uh, but it's only one possible outcome. If we saw a, um, an improvement in supply chains, if we saw, and obviously I hope it's the case, a, a rapid end to the, the war in Ukraine, uh, then potentially inflation pressures could, could ease relatively quickly. And so when building a, a portfolio, it's really important that we don't sort of, uh, crowd into uh, one possible future outcome, that you have more of a balance in portfolios. So the portfolio is sufficiently robust to stand a high inflation environment and a low inflation environment uh, so that your, your future returns are not driven by predicting the outcome of inflation. Yeah, okay. Completely understand. So to go back to your point on UK stocks and maybe widen it out to European stocks more generally, I mean, I was looking at the FTSE 100 prior to the call. It's down a couple of percent since uh, the invasion was an, uh, announced and actually year to date, it's not doing too badly. I mean, around sort of four or five percent down year to date, I think. And obviously, when you compare that to the US stock market, the losses seem more manageable. And I guess that speaks to your point around having sort of some big energy companies in that index and things like that, which are obviously performing particularly well right now. So, you know, at Morningstar and, and, and you personally, do you see good value in UK and European stocks when you compare them, relatively speaking, to US? Yeah, so I think we need to separate out Europe and, and UK because they're, they're very different markets. And we'll do that. Let's start with the UK. And, and actually, the, the UK has been our favoured global equity market for um, probably the, the best part of two years now. It was very badly hit by the pandemic. Uh, and of course, didn't bounce as quickly as U.S. equities did, partly because of that large tech exposure in the U.S. And so in an environment of very low interest rates, very strong government support, um, a greater reliance that we all have on, on technology uh, during and following the, the pandemic, uh, then the U.S. market was driven much, much higher and became much more expensive than the U.K., Whereas the uh, exposure in the UK to financials and to energy companies, as, as you mentioned, uh, meant that it was a very unpopular market. And so what we've seen really over the last six months is that sentiment turn around, as it tends to do when sentiment reaches an extreme, and it, it seemed to reach an extreme there. And so we've had a better performance relative by the UK market uh, to, to the US market. And, and so we still see the, the, the UK market as being attractive uh, compared to the U.S. market, it's not as attractive as it as it was, uh, but it's it's still much more attractive than the, the U.S. Uh, Europe sits somewhere in between, uh, so it's certainly more attractive than the U.S. market, uh, but it doesn't have some of those really out of favour stocks like energy companies and uh, less exposure to financials, and so it really wasn't driven to the same levels of of value that the U.K. was. And so there's some fantastic companies in in Europe. Uh, they're not priced as richly as they are in the US at the moment, uh, but there's less of, a, less of a gap there. So we would still favour the UK, but less so than we did about six months ago. Well, let's use this juncture then to dig into some specific equity sectors. Uh, the current geopolitical environment has, of course, as we've just touched on there, thrown the energy sector under the spotlight. With prices surging due to disruption, I mean, most obviously, you know, the energy sector has actually been the top performing since the invasion became apparent on the 23rd, stocks like Chevron are up 17%. I saw Occidental Petroleum is up 47%. Obviously, the interest from Berkshire Hathaway has, has helped to bolster that stock as well. But is this an area for long-term equity investors to look at? Or actually, should they avoid this part of the market due to the current geopolitical environment? That's a really interesting question because... Uh, there you're trying to balance the, the valuation that we that we see uh, versus the, the quality of, of these businesses. Mm. So if we think really long term, so if you had to lock your portfolio in a box now and, and not get it out again for another decade, then you probably wouldn't get a great return on your on your energy companies because they go through go through cycles. Uh, and they went, you know, just the cycle we're in, they went from being deeply out of favor in, in 
2020 uh, to being in favor now because of all say, the geopolitical tension, uh, but also something that was already happening before that, which is why we favored energy so much, which is that uh, post the, the onset of the pandemic, uh, these businesses decided they were going to stop investment, conserve cash, batten down the hatches and get through the, the, the pandemic at a time of very low oil price, prices and, and very, uh, very weak demand. And what happened is as they, as they did that, prices came back very strongly, but they were uh, still not investing in future capacity. And so that was uh, delivering enormous cash flows for these, these businesses. And that was b- before uh, the latest invasion of Ukraine. So, so that was already happening. Now we've seen that uh, additional tension, not to increase prices much, much higher. Uh, but there's, there's, there still seems to be limited I- investment going, going on there. But if we roll forward for the long term, then these businesses do face challenges in terms of movement away from traditional sources of energy. Uh, they face challenges in terms of um, the likelihood of increased supply when uh, energy prices are so high. And so long term, they're, uh, they're likely to deliver less high quality earnings than you would get from, uh, from other businesses. But they still look reasonably attractive uh, at the moment, still look attractively priced. And so uh, still part of a, a, a long term portfolio until uh, they get so expensive that there's, there's no upside, upside there. If you're, if you're looking at really long term holdings, then of course it's the quality of the business that makes that ability to, to throw off long term cash flow to deliver earnings growth. And so you're, you're then into much more predictable uh, companies even though they're priced much more richly at, at the moment. Of course, part of active portfolio management is looking at what's discounting the price at the moment, looking at where the value is and uh, balancing that near-term value against the long-term quality to try and make sure that you're, uh, you're paying the best price for the opportunity there. Yeah, great. And if, then, if, if long-term investors maybe should not completely avoid that area of the market, but maybe not make it central to portfolios for you know a multi-decade time horizon, for example. Where where should long-term investors be looking? You know, we don't need to talk specific stocks here, but I just wonder generally whether you know the defensive sectors and the defensive areas of the market are the places to look, or actually there are still opportunities in the the more cyclical or sensitive sectors too. So th- there are certainly opportunities in in those uh, cyclical or sensitive areas. Uh, right now, and with investing, we don't know how how long that will take to to play out. So, fortunately, most of us don't have to lock our portfolio in a box. We can make changes uh, over the course of the the, the next decade. And so, uh, I, I think the the most attractive uh, parts of the market are in those more cyclical, more sensitive areas right now. Uh, those the long term, very high quality, uh, let's call them technology businesses, and even some of the defensive businesses. Uh, look less attractively priced, uh, but there will come a time uh, where you'll be able to to pick those up at much more attractive valuations. That's how market cycles work, and and then when you can pick up great quality businesses at really attractive prices, then that's the the the, the ultimate aim for for investors. So it, I would say we're not there yet with some of these really high quality uh, growth businesses, uh, but we'll probably get there. Whereas we're seeing much better opportunities in the cyclical businesses. But again, not as many as we were seeing six months or, or, or 12 months ago. And so as we think about portfolios right now, uh, as I mentioned earlier, having a robust portfolio uh, that can uh, withstand the sort of various market uh, turmoils and various outcomes is, is more important than overemphasizing just one part of the market because we're not seeing those really big pockets of value that we saw over the last two years. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Well, to take all of that into, into consideration then, and to hopefully leave the listeners with some sort of key useful takeaways, uh, I think firstly, we've alluded to it a couple of times already as well. How important do you think it is for investors to think long-term, first of all? I think that's evident that you think it is pretty important, but perhaps a more pertinent question then is actually what long-term means and how retail investors specifically can gauge their time horizon? Yeah, that's absolutely the key question for, uh, for investors. I'm so, so glad you focused on that because for most, uh, most of us as investors, we are planning 10, 20, 30 years ahead. Uh, and so with that time scale, 
then really what happens over the next few days, weeks and, and months doesn't make that much of a, of a difference. And so uh, getting the, the right level of risk into portfolios, uh, having that right mix of uh, valuation opportunities and some quality uh, is really the, 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 the key structure of the, of the portfolio. And that should uh, set you up well for that long-term horizon. The challenge is that as investors, we're always tempted to fiddle with portfolios uh, and to make those shorter-term trends. And, and that comes from the fact that when we're stressed or when we're excited, uh, we tend to forget that the future is not deterministic. We become overconfident in our views and then we fiddle with portfolios and then we can get ourselves in, into all sorts of trouble. So the more you can set the portfolio up, uh, with your time horizon in mind, which in reality for most of us is remembering that we don't have a time horizon in the next few years, uh, but we're much more focused on, on the longer term, then if you can do that and get the balance of the portfolio right, then that's most of the battle won, frankly. And then, of course, as, as professional investors, we spend our time trying to, trying to improve on the, the basic risk-adjusted return that you'll get from just being engaged in uh, in uh, capital markets and engaged in, in equities and bonds. But in reality, uh, that engagement, that owning these, uh, this broadly diversified portfolio into the future is going to do most of the work for you. So the less you can, you can tinker and, and fiddle around, the better you're likely to be. Yeah, completely appreciate that should be the, the, the kind of overarching concept, the overarching goal. I guess my question then, is in a turbulent market such as the one that we're seeing now, is it important, relatively speaking, to be somewhat active to avoid any sort of ill exposures that you, you might have had having not foreseen a crisis such as this? Yeah, and again, that's a, a really important point because uh, when you're in a, a market environment that's turbulent, uh, that typically sets off a stress response in us. Uh, and that stress response um, is, is similar for all of us, uh, and it triggers one of three fairly predictable behaviors. And the first is the, is the fight response, and how this manifests itself with investors is that desire to make changes, to try and trade your way through a crisis, to, to try and spot the next upward movement or downward movement, uh, and to be far too active. So the fight response, uh, some people gravitate towards that naturally, and it can cause a real problem because people end up getting whipsawed by price movements uh, and uh, get themselves in all sorts of, of, of muddles. Uh, the second is the flight response. We talked about that earlier. That's the idea that people sell up their investments and just go to cash uh, mm. because it all seems far too stressful. And that uh, that can be really disastrous because people don't tend to get back into markets and don't benefit from that long-term compounding effect of investment. Uh, but the third response is the freeze response, where people just don't do anything. They don't look at their, their portfolio. And that's likely to be less harmful, uh, but it can still be harmful. And so in, in this environment, it, it is important uh, to think about uh, whether changes need to be made. It's, it's tough to do in a, in a rational, thoughtful way because the market is, is stressful. Uh, but, but if you can do that, uh, then that can improve the, the long-term returns. And the most obvious thing that people should be thinking about is rebalancing portfolios. So if you find that your portfolio is getting out of shape, so when markets fall very sharply, normally you end up having a lot more in your fixed income part of your portfolio or more, or more in cash, a lot less in investment, in equity investments, even though prices have fallen, so they're more attractive, uh, then you probably want to start by, by rebalancing the portfolio before you make any bigger decisions about positioning. So, so keep an eye on portfolios because that can uh, make a benefit. Just try to avoid that desire to tinker and to be over-aggressive in your trading. Yeah, and I guess fundamental to that then and to stick with that long-term approach and to stick with the convictions you have in the various equity investments that you've got in your portfolio. You need to sort of block out all of this macro noise that we've discussed uh, and hopefully identify the intrinsic value of the securities that you're invested in. And obviously, that's a really difficult thing to do. So I just wondered whether you had any tips for the listeners as to how best to actually achieve that. Yeah, absolutely. So you're you're right that it is identifying that intrinsic value. And so uh, we could spend a lot of time 
talking about building discounted cash flow uh, valuation models to get an idea of what that value might be. Um, I'm sure everyone listening to this would be would be asleep uh, before we got to the, the end of that. But but you can, you know there's plenty of tools available uh, to to help you uh, look at the valuation of a of a business. The most important thing to do is to understand that the fundamentals of any investment are dynamic, and so as the future is uncertain. Uh, there's no one uh, perfect uh, value. And so uh, in our business, in Morningstar Investment Management, we spend a lot of time thinking about the range of possible outcomes, uh, the range of possible valuations, rather than just anchoring on one particular valuation uh, metric, because that really helps us uh, understand that the future is uncertain. Uh, it helps us overcome the overconfidence that naturally goes with investment. Uh, and, and so particularly in a situation like this, where although the prices are moving very sharply, equally the fair value, the fundamental value of investments may also be moving. And so when you have that dynamic system, it's really important to try and think of, uh, of the range of possible outcomes. You know, what, are, what is a really bad outcome uh, looks like what does a good outcome look like, and if you can try and hold in your head uh, that range of outcomes, then that's going to help you make fewer mistakes of being overconfident about one particular outcome, uh, and then regretting that later. Yeah, absolutely, and I think you know maybe digging into the specific fundamentals of what you might choose to look for in a in a, a particular business might be. A dry subject, but what could be interesting is qualitative sort of factors that you can look for in businesses, things like network effects in software and technology companies, for example, or even just competitive advantages generally, I suppose, could be an interesting way to look at potential equity investments. Is there any thoughts around those sorts of factors that, that spring to mind? Yeah, absolutely. And so whenever you're building a valuation for a business or an industry or a market as a whole, then you've really got to marry up the narrative with the, the numbers. Mm. Uh, and there's a wonderful explanation of, of this from Aswath Damodaran, who just has forgotten more about valuation than any of us will ever know. Really. And he's just a brilliant uh, explainer of how to, how to value business. And so you've got to think about the situation that a, that a, a business operates in, Think about the value of those, those network effects, also the investment uh, that the business is making to maintain and to grow uh, that, uh, th those network effects and, and the other benefits that you get. Even though it is a little dry to think about some of these, these numbers, I think it's quite helpful to, to realize that when investment is really all about long-term future cash flows, then as you think about valuing a, a business, you're really focused on what drives those long-term cash flows. And very simply, that's the, the long-term growth in, in revenues. Mm -hmm. That's the margin that these businesses will make on those revenues that they convert to profits. And then it's what those businesses do with those profits, how much they pay out uh, to us as shareholders and how much they uh, reinvest back into the business. And then the return of, uh, of the capital that they will turn on the capital that they reinvest uh, into, into the business, and then uh, what should be the, the, the cost of the capital that we supplied those businesses. And, and really, if you can focus on those areas, uh, then you'll be able to build a, a reasonable valuation. And as you focus on those areas, of course, that's where we get back into that range of outcomes, because we'll realize there is no one profit margin. It depends on how that business evolves. You say it depends on how uh, the, the network benefits accrue and uh, and how they're able to develop into, into new markets, how they're able to expand uh, their, uh, their market share. And so all of these things then create these, these ranges of, of outcomes. But just focus on how that business is going to uh, deliver cash flow, uh, how far in the future those cash flows are going to be, and the rate at which those cash flows should be discounted back uh, into today's terms to give you a valuation of the, of the business. And if you're able to do that and bring into your mind all of those, uh, those issues around uh, network benefits, the narrative of the business, uh, then you won't go far wrong. Yeah, fantastic. And I want to finish by trying to understand, I guess, how you bring that all together under one sort of holistic, diversified portfolio. But before I do, hopefully you just indulge a brief tangent here. I think it is relevant to the current market environment. We, we try to place a thematic lens over markets here at Opto. That's kind of what we're all about. 
Um, and it struck me that obviously the shorter term noise, turbulence, volatility that we're seeing at the moment, uh, a way to address that might be to think about secular rather than cyclical trends that often some of these thematic investment themes can, can give you. What, to what extent do you think that is a useful approach uh, in terms of looking at equity markets? Uh, I, do, I was just interested to get your thoughts and Morningstar's kind of position on that. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the challenge with, with themes and trends is that they're much easier to see in, in hindsight mm -hmm. than they are with, with foresight. And again, yeah. this goes back to the fact that the future is uncertain. As human beings, we uh, dislike uncertainty. Uh, because we perceive uncertainty as risk. And so we try and avoid uncertainty where we can and typically look for, for false certainty. And so as, as human beings, one of our great skills is our ability to recognize patterns. Uh, and once we recognize patterns, we look for consequences. And so when we're thinking about investment themes, then we can see patterns in the current markets, and that leads us to extrapolate those themes out into, into the future. And that could be a, a perfectly good thought experiment, as long as we remember that there is that range of possible outcomes. And these themes, these trends will be dynamic. Uh, and then second, uh, if we're able to recognize those themes and trends, then we're probably not the only ones. Uh, so other people have also recognized them. And so that's where we need to work out how much of that, uh, that future is already priced in. And so a, a good example of this may be some of the, the U.S. technology businesses where uh, people realized that there would be a, a, a trend towards working from home, obviously, as a result of the pandemic. Uh, and they were absolutely right in, in doing that. But as those beliefs were reflected in the price of some of these businesses, the prices rose so high that even though we are now all working from home, we're all using uh, these technological systems, uh, actually, the price has fallen recently because that exponential growth wasn't enough to justify the change in, in prices. And so it can, be a, it can be a really useful way of, of identifying opportunities and, and lead you into doing deeper research. But in reality, remember, what we're, we're looking for is, uh, is businesses, assets that are priced attractively relative to a, a range of possible outcomes, not just uh, a single outcome that would be delivered by a, by a theme. So a great way to start your research but you need to go beyond that uh, to look at valuation. Yeah, fantastic. We hope you're enjoying the episode. For interviews like this every Thursday, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, make sure you give us a star rating and leave guest suggestions along with any other feedback in the review section. Now, back to the show. Okay, well, let's bring it all back then and finish on portfolio construction, I suppose. How important, and you know, we focused on equities today as we are a stock market-focused publication. Uh, so that's the reason for that. But how important is it to employ a diversified asset allocation strategy right now? So I think the construction of your portfolio, asset allocation, is always the most important thing. And it's, it's the most important thing for two main reasons. But the first is that it will drive returns. Uh, so when you, when you make an investment, the, the heavy lifting, as I said, is, is done by the fact that Capitalist societies are very good at creating returns for, for shareholders over the long term. And so the more you have in, in equities, the, uh, the, the higher your likely returns are going to be over that very long term. Now, over the next five to 10 years, what tends to dominate returns is going to be change in valuation. But when we get beyond that to, to 20 or 30 years, then it's going to be just in, be engaged in capital markets. So the more you can be engaged in, in equity markets, the higher your equity exposure will be that will drive your return. So asset allocation is, is key. The other part of that is that, of course, the more you have invested in equities, the more volatile your portfolio is, is likely to be. And so that brings risk with it because most of us aren't able to see our entire capital base uh, move in line with equity markets. And so that leads to those behavioral challenges we've talked about already. That leads potentially to the, to the fight, flight, or freeze response, which can uh, result in people selling their investments at exactly the wrong time. And so having enough diversifying assets in your portfolio so that you can control your own behavior and stay invested in the really tough parts of the market and equally uh, not get too excited 
when markets are rising quickly, that's the second benefit of, of good asset allocation. That asset allocation is not just about generating returns, it's about delivering a, a portfolio that you can live with as an investor so that you can stay engaged over a long enough time period that you can benefit from those, those market movements. So that's the basis of it. Beyond that, uh, then it's trying to improve the returns you get from the market by overemphasizing or adding assets that are, are mispriced, where they're typically unpopular. People uh, have turned against these assets. They've fallen out of favor for, for reasons of news flow, and then trying to have less exposure to those assets which are, uh, which are very much in favor with there's only good news uh, in, the, in the price. And where people tend to fall down is they see valuation as a timing signal, and it's really not. Uh, it's possible for cheap companies to get much cheaper, expensive companies to get far more expensive, and for that to go on for months and years. So valuation is not a timing signal over the next next year. It's probably going to determine returns over the next five to 10 years, which is why it's so important for, for an investor, but it's not going to tell you what happens over the, the next few months. So the danger is that you end up being too focused on, uh, on what's going to happen over the, the next days, weeks, and months, and not focus enough over the next, uh, next year. So, so yes, asset allocation, mix of, of investments, not just between equity and bonds, uh, but between assets that will do well if we have a high inflation environment and assets that will do well if we have a low inflation environment. Uh, so all of these things go towards creating a robust portfolio, uh, which you can live with for the next 20 or, or, or 30 years. So, so that's the, the essence of it. Uh, and of course, very little of that has to do with uh, what what market changes are going to be over the, the very near term. Yeah, fantastic. I think that's a really nice insight actually to end the main body of the interview on. We now can finish, I think, with our quick fire question round. So this is just a generic list of questions. We ask all of the guests and just a lighthearted way to end the episode. Feel free to answer in as little as one sentence or even one word if you like. We've got five questions. The first one. What is the most frequent mistake investors make, do you think? So the, the most frequent mistake is to be overconfident in, in what you're doing. And we've talked about that a lot, so I'm not going to elaborate too much. But remember that most of us have no advantage when predicting short-term market movements. Most of us, if we're thinking about investment, become overconfident. And that can be really detrimental. So just try and control that overconfidence uh, when you're uh, when you're making investment decisions. Yeah, really important. Okay, question two: Where do you go for your investment or economic insights? Do you read specific publishers at all? Yeah, so so most things out there are noise uh, and they generate uh, bad outcomes. So I tend to read people who take that longer term perspective. And so my favorite author, my favorite researcher is uh, Michael Mobison, uh, who's a consilient research part of Morgan Stanley. Uh, he produces uh, just an amazing paper most months. He's read so much. He's such a great uh, communicator, a really deep investment theme. So I encourage people to, to dig out his work. Uh, Cliff Astens at uh, AQR and the whole team there, again, really good long-term interesting research. Rob Arnott at Research Affiliates, they do some fantastic work in terms of uh, the overall structure of markets and the, the premiums that are built in. Ben Inco at GMO, Howard Marks at Oak Tree. And finally, I, I've mentioned Dama Darren already at NYU mm. Stern. He's, he's actually got his, uh, his lecture series uh, available free online in terms of how to, how to value. That's a great start for anybody thinking about investing for themselves. Yeah, fantastic. And we've actually uh, interviewed Rob on the podcast. So I'd encourage listeners to dig out that episode as well. Um, question three, then, what is the most memorable moment from your career to date? Pretty tricky one, this, uh, but what do you think? Yeah, so, you know, I, I, I thought about this for a long, long time, and there's just not one moment. And I, I think the reason for that is that we work in the most amazing environment where each day is different. Each day brings new challenges, new opportunities. I work with some amazing colleagues. And so I just couldn't pinpoint one day. There's, there's all sorts of days. The, the day the US stock market fell by, by 12% in the middle of the, the, the pandemic, and to see how the team responded to that, that was a really great day. There's been, there's been days when, uh, earlier in my career, where I was working directly with end investors where I was able to tell people they had enough money uh, to retire and, and to see the, their face light up 
uh, as they as they were able to do that. That was a you know, that was a great moment. There's been moments where I've been appointed to new roles and been able to get stuck in. So I'd love to say there's been one moment, but what's wonderful about investment is that every day is different. It is it is a career that's full of challenging but really wonderful moments. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, if you could go back in time then and dig through all of those sort of opportunities and interesting moments, would you give yourself or what if you did give yourself a top tip, would that be? What would one bit of advice be if you could go back in time? Yeah, so I think that the key piece of advice is to remember that uh, most of the feedback you get uh, from investing is very poor quality because it's driven by price noise. Uh, and so uh, it's very tough to learn how to be a good investor because a good learning depends on good feedback. So if you, if you play a musical instrument, uh, when you play a note wrong, but you get immediate feedback and you learn to correct it. Investment's not like that because of the, the, the price variability. And so I would have made much better, faster progress if I'd realized that early on in my career, that I'd, uh, I'd tried to turn off uh, the feedback response from, from price and just really looked at the feedback response of changing fundamentals. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, well, this is our final question then. This is sort of the opto question we aim to speak to the investors, the hedge fund managers, the publishers, whoever it might be, aiming to outperform benchmark returns. So we always ask them, what is an investor's best source of alpha? So if you had to narrow it down to one thing, where do you think the great investors derive their outperformance? Yeah, so, so Bill Miller posed this question and answered it really, really well. And what he said is there were, there were three sources of, of alpha, uh, three sources of edge that we can have as investors. The first is informational. If you know something that no one else knows, then you can make money out of that. The, the problem is, in most cases, that's illegal. Uh, it's called insider trading. And so I can't recommend that. Uh, that's that's you know, not something that, that, that we're able to, to use. The second is analytical. That if your analysis is always better than everyone else's, then you will deliver better returns. The problem is there are uh, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people around the world uh, who are incredibly smart, who are all trying to get an analytical edge. And even though we invest an enormous amount in doing that, it's very unlikely that we'll have a consistent analytical edge. So again, that's not realistic. So the third uh, source of alpha is behavioral. If you can behave in a way that other people can't, so if you can buy investments when everybody else hates them, if you can sell them when everybody else uh, loves them, if you can uh, stick into uh, investments uh, when the market is very noisy, then that's a real source of alpha or uh, edge. And that's where we focus our efforts, trying to think about how we make decisions and behave differently from others. Perfect. Yeah, really solid advice. Well, I think that just leaves me to say thank you very much for joining me on the podcast, Dan. It's been a real pleasure. Hey, it's been great to be with you. Thank you so much for having me on. Thanks for listening, everyone. Just a quick note before we sign off. If you're looking for an easily digestible daily update on the markets, this might be of interest. Opto Updates is our short newsletter sent every day during the trading week, giving you a bulleted list of the top seven stories from the global stock markets. We've done the hard work for you, highlighting relevant opportunities and trends. And in addition, we'll also keep you notified of any new products, stock reports, or webinars from the Opto world. If you're interested, sign up using the link in the show notes. And thanks also to CoFruition for consulting on and producing the show. Until next time. Co-fruition.